Learning about mini split circuits can be quite a change from trying to learn older circuits and older units. And the differences here can be explained with a pretty simple musical analogy. So in older circuits, you have more linear sequential nature in the wiring. So you have power coming in, hits one component, then the next component, and the component after that comes back as a common. And as all these components are powered up in the circuit, your unit's up and running. So this would be like a band, a rock band, where the bass player starts the song off, the drums come in behind that, then the guitar's over that, then you have the singer, and now they're all playing a song. Mini split circuitry is different, and it's more like an orchestra, where everybody comes in, plays at the same time, and you have a conductor controlling all these different sections of the band. So he can call for the horns to swell up while the violins quiet down, and control how fast or how slow, how loud or how softly each part of that orchestra plays. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna bring in a schematic off a Daikin system. I'm gonna do my best to show you how all these different parts physically connect through this schematic. But what we're really gonna focus on is how all these different parts are in play simultaneously and come together like an orchestra being controlled by a conductor. So what I want to do is I want to start off by showing you components you're not going to see in typical schematics in older systems. So I'm talking about is like right here, you have what's called a reactor, you have varistors, you have resistors, you have diode bridges, intelligent power modules. What all these components basically are is they're all designed to manipulate and control and stabilize the electrical signal traveling through all these circuits. Now the secret sauce in many split systems is the ability to modulate and control little changes in voltages and frequency so that we can vary the power supply to our motors to get all these different speeds out of it. So when you have a motor that's capable of running from 100% all the way down to let's say 20% capacity, you have a lot of different points in between there that you can hit. And in order to be able to have that kind of control, you really need a very stable, very clean signal that doesn't vary a lot in frequencies and voltages. Um, if you have a five volt DC circuit that's varying by as much as two volts, that can lead to erratic behavior on a motor. So we need all these components in the system to really stabilize things and give us the control we really need to deliver the type of efficiency these systems are really well known for. So let's bring power into our schematic here. We'll start all the way to the left where a lot of people are familiar with and a lot of YouTube videos are about that's the power whip the power coming into the condensing unit and our communication wire here so we see all that right here now here we see leg one and leg two so that means we're dealing with 230 volts here now on a side note there are some mini split systems uh, particularly smaller ones at 6,000 9,000 12,000 BTUs that might actually run on 120 but anything higher than that's definitely going to be 230 and sometimes even the lower ones are also 230 so just keep that in mind uh, whenever you work on these types of systems now over here we have our power going to our indoor unit and that's on terminals one and two uh, that is 115 volts alternating current on each one of those to deliver 230 to the indoor header um, and terminal number three here that is our communication wire so this is a dc voltage it's not an ac voltage now one thing i want to mention when it comes to testing for a dc voltage here is that you can use terminals two and three to get a dc voltage reading because that terminal two here is used as a common reference for that DC circuit um, as well as the AC circuit. But one thing you definitely want to keep in mind here is when you're using a multimeter, you definitely want to use what's called a true RMS or root mean square multimeter. So here I have two multimeters. I have my field piece on the left and I have a UEI on the right. And if you look at that UEI up close, you can see right on there, it says true RMS. Now a true RMS multimeter is built a little more rugged and it can handle situations like this where you can take a DC reading off your meter, even if there's AC voltage present, um, and you'll get an accurate reading without damaging your meter. If I were to do the same test with my field piece, at best, I might get an inaccurate reading and at worst, I could fry my multimeter. So if you're gonna be working on mini split systems and diagnosis, 
mesothelioma, I would strongly suggest getting yourself a true RMS meter and just using that all the time because you do definitely have a good mix of high voltage alternating current and low voltage DC current mixed together within these systems. So bringing our power in past the terminals here and onwards into the unit, we come to this black rectangle here. And what that is, is called a ferrite core. Now what a ferrite core is, it kind of wraps around the wire and it protects the circuit from electromagnetic interference or EMI. So we're talking about noise and, and interruptions to the frequency that might come from nearby power lines, cell phones, secret broadcasts by shadow governments, that sort of stuff. So right out of the gates, we're already trying to control and stabilize the electrical signal coming into this unit. Now our next component in this lineup is the printed circuit board. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to the conductor of the orchestra. This is where the brains are. There's a microprocessor in there. It's a computer chip with all kinds of computer logic programmed into it. There's probably a 17 year old kid with a PhD back at the brand headquarters, crunching all these numbers and algorithms together. But basically what this is, is <clears throat> this board constantly receives input signals from throughout the entire system. So we're talking about temperatures, pressures, voltages, frequencies. It's a constant monitoring of the entire system through all these sensors. And this is a constant feedback loop. So the PCB or the printed circuit board receives all this data, crunches it in this algorithm over and over and over again. And then it produces output signals or commands that tell the major components in the system what to do. So what speed the indoor fan motor needs to run, the outdoor fan motor, the compressor, how much the electronic expansion valve should open or close. Um, all this stuff is decided by the PCB. Now moving on in our schematic, we see a coil here and we have two lines in between and what that is is an iron core. So one thing you want to take notice of right away is that this coil, it's not a standalone coil like you would find in a condensing unit on a traditional split system. Um, this is actually part of the printed circuit board. So unlike a traditional coil or a contactor coil in a condensing unit where a simple 24 volt signal from the thermostat that's calling for cooling activates the coil this coil is controlled by the powered circuit board that's constantly monitoring all these inputs so there is a lot of logic behind whether or not this coil gets the power it needs to energize you know, so the PCB is controlling when that happens and once that gets energized um, these switches will close and these are the switches to the main power components in your system. Now this iron core in here, it's another layer of filtering the signal coming in. Um, that iron core, it strengthens the magnetic field and helps filter out higher frequencies that are unwanted in this circuit. Moving on, we have a crankcase heater here. And if you don't know, the whole purpose of a crankcase heater is to separate the refrigerant from the oil and buff cycles and it prevents refrigerant migration. And now we come to our reactor here. Now, the purpose of a reactor is just another layer of filtering. Uh, it filters out inrush current. So like when a motors first start up, they, they pull a higher current. It kind of flattens that out. Uh, voltage spikes. It helps with uh, reducing electrical noise and disturbance, uh, harmonic distortions, power factor. I mean, it works on a lot of different things to help stabilize that circuit even more. Now moving on, we come to a diode bridge. And what a diode bridge is, it's a rectifier. It converts an alternating current signal to a DC signal. And the reason why we're doing this is because a DC signal is a little more stable. Uh, we could have a little bit more control over it and manipulate it better. Now you're gonna have different arrangements when it comes to diode bridges in these units. Uh, sometimes you might have one diode bridge that feeds one power module for like the compressor. You might have another one that feeds another power module just for the condenser fan motor um, because these motors use different voltages to operate them. Sometimes you might have diode bridges in series um, together and that just adds another label of stability and control, less interference in the circuits and things of that nature. Here we have uh, filter capacitors and again, that's just another layer of stability and control helps uh, stabilize the 
the signal. And everything we've done so far to stabilize this circuit all comes down to this right here, the intelligent power module. All right, so the reason why we're trying to control this circuit and stabilize it as much as possible is because this intelligent power module is now going to manipulate that signal and alter it so that we can deliver exactly the amount of power we need to this motor here. So this is our compressor right here. We're gonna deliver the exact amount of power we need to do the job at hand and not an ounce more. So the more control you have over it, the more efficiency you can kind of squeeze out of it. Now, before I dive too deep into these power modules, I just wanna back up one minute here and zoom out. You notice that we have two PCBs here. So that's one here and we have another one here. Um, not all systems are going to have two PCBs. Some might just have one. Um, all this really is, is it adds another layer of control over these circuits. So you can isolate circuits and have a little bit more control over each one so there's less interference. So what we're looking at here is probably a system that has a higher SEER rating, a higher efficiency rating. So this might be a system that has, let's say, somewhere in the ballpark of mid-20 SEER rating. And you can see here all these wires here, these are the PCBs just communicating with one another. So you have one PCB here taking all kinds of temperature readings of the outdoor ambient air. Uh, so we could see here outdoor air, discharge temperatures on the compressor, the uh, condenser coil, um, all these temperatures outside. We also have a PCB on the indoor header doing the same thing. It's taking the temperature of the ambient air in the room, which is the important one. That's the one we're trying to control. Air across the evaporator coil, uh, these PCBs are also relaying, you know, fan speed, motor speed data, you know, all kinds of stuff. So everything is communicating with each other to get back to the main PCB with the chip in it that's making all the decisions. Now there's different types of sensors in these systems. Some of them are going to be digital. So anything that's reading frequencies or voltages are going to be digital sensors. But we also have sensors called thermistors. And so that's what we have here. We have a bunch of thermistors. And basically what a thermistor is, it's a resistor. But the resistance value changes with changes in temperature or pressure. So for example, how it would work, your PCB would send out five volts DC, so it's a low DC voltage. The thermistor will have a different resistance value based on the temperature and it'll filter that voltage and send it back to the PCB again. So we can actually assign a certain temperature to a certain voltage. And as the temperature changes, the resistance changes, the voltage changes, and the PCB can track temperature changes, which of course converts all that, sending it back to the PCB. The PCB takes those temperatures, keeps crunching it through an algorithm over and over again, and then sends that data back out to the IPM to carry out whatever commands the PCB is deciding on the capacity of the components in the system. At what capacity the compressor will run, the outdoor fan motor will run, the indoor fan motor will run, and so on. Now you notice we have two intelligent power modules here. We have one here dedicated solely for the compressor, and we have another one right here that's dedicated to the outdoor fan motor. So these power modules, their job is to carry out the commands coming from the PCB um, to regulate power supply into these motors so that we can run them at very specific capacities. So not all power modules are created equal. Um, this one for the compressor, what it does is it takes that very stable DC voltage, um, probably be somewhere in a ballpark, let's say 300, 325 volts DC, and then it'll convert that into a simulated three phase alternating current power supply. And I'll give you one guess why we turn it into a three phase power supply. If you guess control and stability, congratulations. So that's why we have three wires here, W, V, U. These are your windings in the motor and your common. Now this power module over here, this motor, the outdoor fan motor, it's a DC motor. So we only need really 24 to 48 volts DC to run this motor. So this power module is not gonna convert DC back into AC like this one does. Um, this one is just gonna regulate that DC voltage down to whatever capacity we need to run this motor at. So at, let's say at 48 volts DC, we run the motor at full speed. At 24 volts, it might be like half speed or something like that, so you, you get the idea. We also have uh, a power module in the indoor unit 
that does exactly the same thing for the indoor motor. The only difference is that power module will be probably a little bit less voltage. Instead of 24 to 48, you might see more like 12 to 24 volts on that one. Now here's one thing I want to point out about mini split schematics that are a little bit different from more conventional schematics. So what we have right here, this is our reversing valve, okay, on a heat pump system. And what you have, usually when you have two lines coming into any kind of a component like that on a conventional schematic, you know, it might be two power legs or a power in a neutral or something like that. It's showing the same circuit. But on this schematic, what you're actually seeing here is that this is a actual power line. So this is alternating current that's going to power the reversing valve itself. This one here is actually a control voltage. This is a DC voltage. So this might be 12 to 24 volts DC. So you're not seeing two wires part of the same circuit here. What you're actually seeing are two different power circuits. And when you're dealing with equipment that has 230 volts and a DC voltage, you're not gonna see a lot of neutrals and commons in schematics like this. So how this reversing valve works, um, here's our power coming in. That's our 115. If we trace that all the way back, it takes us back to L2, right? So it goes through a resistor here, right? Stabilizes the signal, goes through another diode bridge. And this diode bridge converts it to a 12 or 24 volt DC signal, sends it back out, and that's our control contact there that activates the solenoid based on the command sent from the PCB. Now our 115, before it goes into that diode bridge and turns into a control voltage, it feeds the solenoid valve itself. And when this contact closes, uh, the other leg is connected to the reversing valve and it can actually actuate. Over here, we have our electronic expansion valve. Um, and that is also controlled by the PCB. And this can be anywhere from 24 volts DC up to maybe 120 volts DC, but this is going to be a DC signal going to the solenoid to situate that valve wherever it needs to be to monitor the refrigerant flow through the system. So everything is can, you know, done by the brain in the system, sending out these signals based on all the data input that's coming in. Now over here, we have an overload protector. We have another one over here. Again, that's just protective components in the system for surges in the system and things of that nature. Uh, I also mentioned varistors earlier on in the video. Uh, they act kind of like a shunt, kind of do the same thing. Any surges in the power supply, it'll send it to earth ground there. So you can see there's absolutely a huge effort here to really control these circuits and stabilize them. So as you pretty much gathered, the level of control here is just completely obscene, the micromanagement going on. But this level of control is what gives us the ability to squeeze more and more efficiency out of the system um, so that we can reach these really high SEER ratings for power savings. 20 years ago, 14 SEERs was amazing. Now it's barely legal um, and we're hitting up to 27, 28 SEERs and onwards. And this is the direction everything's heading. Uh, pretty soon you're not going to see permanent split capacitor motors anymore, or even e EMCs. Everything's going to be inverters. So you got to learn, you got to keep up. Uh, so you don't get left behind. That said, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, if you guys can help me out, just comment, interact with the video somehow so that the YouTube algorithm can show it to other guys um, and women and they can learn as well, just like hopefully you did. So with that said, I'm Jersey Mike. Thanks for watching.